All right, everyone. Well, welcome once again. We're very excited for you to join us today on this Tuesday afternoon or morning. I'm very excited to um, see you all in the space. I am Manuela Contreras, the leadership manager here at the council, and I run our Career Pathways program. We're very excited. We're in the midst of our Career Pathways application, and it's a perfect opportunity for us to highlight one of the wonderful work that one of our alumni and alumnus is doing here in the sector. And so I'm excited to welcome you all and share with you and learn with you about some of the knowledge work that folks are doing in philanthropy. So our facilitator for today, who I'm excited to introduce and then pass it over to is Dr. Angela Frazier. And she is our alumnus from the class of Career Pathways 2011 cohort, and she is the director from the Knowledge Designs to Change. So she's going to be leading our conversation. Hi, Angela. Welcome. Hi, Manuela. Thank you so much. And as said, I'm Angela Prashanti from Knowledge Designs to Change, and I want to welcome everybody today to this conversation. Um, I work as a partner with organizations and in initiatives that are about social change and I'm your organizer for today. As mentioned, um, I'm Career Pathways alum. I believe it was cohort three, so back in the day before it became wildly successful, and it was a great experience. And I wanna thank you to the, take, thank the council for hosting this webinar to really open up a conversation on knowledge work. We will be in kind of this traditional format today but as Manuela said, please use the chat box for any questions or comments. And even as we're getting started, um, feel free to introduce yourselves and let us know where you're joining us from. And just in case we don't get time, we don't have time to get to all the questions, uh, we will be sharing contact information for our speakers. The video, as Manuela said, will be available. And of course, I'd be happy to answer any questions about knowledge designs to change. We'll share all that email information at the end of the discussion. Next slide, please. So in a few minutes, I'll be asking my colleagues to introduce themselves and share their experiences. And I just wanna thank them right now, Dan Darbandi, Kara Strong, Strawn, and Brad Work for taking part today. I'm really excited about the examples and insights that I have had the opportunity to learn about during our conversations over the past few weeks. I do wanna start with a few notes just to frame our talk today so that we all know kind of what we are up to this afternoon. Next slide, please. So first, a little bit more about me and how I'm entering today. I've been in the field of change initiatives in varying ways and in different roles over more than 20 years now. And my work has spanned civic space, community nonprofits and evaluation, intermediaries, academia, both as faculty and also in university community partnerships. And I've been engaged in community, community engaged research. And since 2008, been very solidly inside philanthropy. And I was, I believe the first person, don't quote me on this, but in Connecticut philanthropy that actually had the title of knowledge development officer. So I've been a participant and observer of knowledge work for a while now. And all of this time has been spent really at the intersection of social science research and change strategy. A number of years ago, I had the opportunity to do a doctoral dissertation, specifically on reporting in philanthropic initiatives. And I know that doesn't sound very exciting, you know, studying the reports of initiatives, but what I discovered that was really interesting at the time for me was that even in efforts that were supposed to be about learning and change, which many of us are involved in, the report at the end looked pretty much like the report at the beginning, even though we, we were told that learning and change was happening. So much of what I wanted to hear about what was happening within funded change efforts was never really being talked about publicly. And another way of thinking about that is basically what was being called knowledge seemed to be more about legitimizing the folks with that design power um, who, and making it seem like they knew how things were going to go from the very beginning. 
And this was interesting to me, as well as kind of the discomfort that my committee had about even talking about this. You know, it was the taboo thing you didn't talk about. And that experience set me on a path of continuing to ask how we can be both intentional and in research terms, for some, that means rigorous and systematic, and how we can be intentional in our social science approach and at the same time, really creative in aligning how we engage in knowledge work in ways that actually are about the change and the transformation goals of our initiatives. Next slide, please. So for me, philanthropy is key to doing this. It's, it's the right space to be in for reasons that we really don't have time to delve into today, but I wanna be transparent about some of my beliefs. I do believe that meaning making is the heart of creative agency and it's our way of being in the world and everyone has a right to be part of the meaning making. I feel strongly that shared meaning making is the soul of social change, whether that is informal or more formal as we're gonna be talking about today. And I really understand knowledge work at, it, at its most basic and in its many forms as embracing both, both the creative agency and social change and as being absolutely essential for co-creating our society. So if we really wanna make the most of what philanthropy has to offer, we need to be about making knowledge work, making the knowledge work as much about the change we wanna see as our strategy and grant making are. So to really give knowledge work the attention it needs to do this. And today, you know, we're, we're doing that by opening up and exploring in this conversation. Next slide, please. So what I've noticed over the years in philanthropy is that we often talk, and I hope everybody relates to this, we talk about the activities like documentation, outcome tracking, focus groups. And these are absolutely important. And there are increasingly equitable ways to do any of these activities. So I'm not saying we should throw these out at all. However, to move toward knowledge work we, where we are actually self-aware and grapple with the how of our activities, we also wanna be asking ourselves and each other what I call activating questions. So things like who gets to ask the questions? Who gets to say what activities or methods work best? Whose lived experience is embraced in design and analysis? And how do our approaches align with our values and purpose? Ultimately, overall, who is involved in the meaning making and in that shared meaning? And what does it look like and feel like for folks? This can be challenging because it requires us rethinking or at least, at least reflecting on what we have learned about building knowledge. And over the past decade in philanthropy, I've witnessed you know, fits and starts about bringing these, those involved in knowledge work together and really wanting to, you know, efforts to recognize knowledge work as a field, if you will. And at the same time, my sense is that the work seems to resist becoming a field. And one of the ways I make sense out of this is when I think about how broad and kind of expansive and how many different roles and reasons knowledge work touches and is part of, and in that sense, then we kind of rightfully resist labeling it as just one thing or another. So moving from knowledge work as activities, as I've mentioned, to these more activating questions, I think can help us to embrace knowledge work as itself action and in showing up in many ways within our change strategies. Next slide, please. So that brings us to today's discussion. Now there's so much creativity to explore, but today we really wanna open up a conversation about knowledge work across different types of foundations, roles, 
missions, and experiences. And we hope to touch on the many topics of interest that you all shared in your registration forms and address those with some tangible examples, ideas of course about equity and change and about knowledge work in relation to movements, democracy building. And we also hope to kind of move a little bit between theory and, and practice as it's useful. And to touch on some of the tensions and challenges and also to highlight you know, these commonalities across various spaces in the work. So to jump in, I've invited three colleagues to engage in today's conversation. They each work in philanthropy, but in various locations and contexts. And I've asked each of them to first introduce themselves and share a bit about their locations to help each of us see ourselves in their spaces. And then we are going to explore how knowledge work has shown up in those spaces. So let's start expanding. And I think if we could get this, yep, exactly. Thank you, Manuela. Have everybody on the screen. And why don't we start with, with Dan to help us understand, Dan, where you sit in philanthropy. Well, thanks, Angela. And thanks for letting me be part of this conversation. Hello, everyone. My name is Dan Darbandi. I use he, him, his pronouns. I am Senior Grants Associate with Borealis Philanthropy. We are a nationally operating uh, grant-making intermediary. And for those of you who are not familiar with grant-making intermediaries, basically we are a 501c3 public charity that makes grants and also raises money. So we kind of operate uh, much like you know a, a foundation, a, a traditional foundation in some ways, but we also have the um, added bonus of raising money, but also that allows us the opportunity to influence a lot of funders in the space that we work in. I personally am located in Norwalk, Connecticut, just down the road from Angela on lands um, on the Wappinger and Lady Lenape lands. And to give you a little bit of a background about Borealis, we're a social justice uh, intermediary. We resource primarily grassroots organizations that exist in social movements everything from you know local bail reform to exploring alternatives to organizations exploring alternatives to police uh, to transgender rights to funding organizations working in journalism looking to advance racial equity so we're really looking to resource the world that we know is possible and in my role uh, at senior grants associate i'm kind of on the front line of knowledge in that i interface with uh, our grantees and applicants regularly. I'm involved in collecting data from them, in working with my team to determine what kind of information we want to ask, uh, whether the information we are asking is the most equitable, um, learning from our movements about you know the kind of work they do and how we can incorporate into that into our work and influence the organizations that fund us. So it's a long way of saying, you know, we are working to influence a better world. Um, but again, we're nationally based. We're a fully virtual organization, have been since the um, pandemic, before the pandemic, and will continue to be so. Um, so I hope that that covers everything that um, you were looking for in the introduction. I will now pass it to my wonderful colleague on the call, Kara. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you, Angela, for having me, um, including me in, as part of this conversation. Um, my name is Kara Strawn. We use um, she, her pronouns, and I am the Strategic Program Manager with the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven. Um, so just to give a little bit of background on um, the Greater New Haven Community Foundation, we serve a 20-town region with um, the city of New Haven really being the central urban core, and we fund and um, have programs across a broad array of issues, um, really eight issue areas that we cover ranging from education, health, basic needs, the environment, social justice and um, civic vitality, uh, you name it, it's really meant to be um, very broad and flexible. So our work kind of breaks down um, and strikes a balance between being a responsive grant maker and that we're very locally based. Um, so nonprofits can apply to us for funding um, for what, as, as, as identified in terms of what they tell us they need. Um, so as long as you sort of fit under that umbrella of those eight issue areas, um, there's a place for you. 
at our foundation. So we have a very um, a long-standing responsive grant making program. In addition to that, we have a, we do many strategic investments, grants, and initiatives. Um, and through that, there are typically multi-year, um, larger amounts, um, long-term investments um, in seeing community change. So our kind of a lead, leading initiative right now is around inclusive growth and expanding economic opportunity, um, primarily focused on BIPOC communities, women, immigrants, um, and really kind of honing in on that via career development, um, sorry, workforce development, career pathways, and investments in entrepreneurship. Um, so in my role, I kind of wear two hats. I kind of like to feel like I'm straddling a little bit of two different worlds. One is the learning and evaluation. Um, so very similar to Dan, um, looking at our reporting and really trying to make meaning out of, of the countless grant reports that um, I review, uh, uh, review over time. Um, and then also just wearing a strategy hat and just having the pleasure of really being able to dig into um, some of the workforce development and inclusive growth issues, working with our fund for women and girls and strategies such as community organizing. So it's kind of like the best of, of both worlds. Um, I live in New Haven. I've lived here for about 10 years and I, I love being a part of community foundation work. It's really rewarding to live and work in a place where you just can see the impact of um, the work that you do in real time. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it to Brad. Hey everyone, uh, thanks so much. Um, thanks Kara, thanks Dan, uh, thanks Angela. I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I'm Brad Rourke. I am a program officer at the Kettering Foundation, use the he series pronouns. Uh, we're a, an operating foundation uh, based in Dayton, Ohio. I'm in our DC uh, satellite office, uh, which is where I'm coming at you from. Uh, our endowment is, uh, depending on how the economy is doing, between 400 and 500 million dollars. But we operate more like a, a research institute than um, than anything else. We we don't do grant making, and um, and, and we don't run our own programs, but we do work with people in community to study really one question, uh, which we've been studying for 40 years now, which is uh, what does it take to make democracy work as it should? By democracy, we mean um, not necessarily solely uh, an institutional governance structure, but rather the, the mechanisms and ways and means by which people in the places that they live exerting their capacities of citizenship. And by that, I don't mean papers. I mean, the, the fundamental act of being a, a resident of a place. How is it that people in those places can, um, can self-rule in better ways? And so we do that work uh, in tandem with people in community, uh, learning alongside them uh, all around the nation and also around the around the world. We've got an international network as, as well on, on almost every continent, save Antarctica uh, and many other um, many countries, um, but also very deeply around uh, the United States. So I'm, I'm really honored uh, and, and excited to be here. I have no idea what I have that can that I can offer other than than what I've, I've heard other people learn along with us. So so with that, I'll, I'll send it back to Angela, who will guide us through, uh, I, I hope, questions that will allow me to offer and others to offer a little something. So thanks again. Really, really, really wonderful to see you all. Thank you all for sharing that. As you can see, just a, a broad range in types, roles, in missions, although, of course, all connected in some way to, well, in all ways, of you know, making the world a better place. Um, through different, different means. So I want to ask you each a question. Um, basically when, you know, talked about knowledge work as shared meaning making. So when you think about knowledge work as, as that basic shared meaning making, how does it show up for you? In particularly in your philanthropic space, although I recognize that that space intersects with um, communities as well. So one of the things that I thought of as we were um, preparing for this session was 
um, to sort of the evolution of thinking uh, over time. And, you know, I, I began at my foundation in 2013, kind of as the person that was going to be reading grant reports and sort of in the space of the interpreter of information. And over time, I've I've grown to understand that share that really is less about one or a few individuals or any foundation being the interpreter of information and really opening it up to community voice and all of the input and the perspectives that that um, that folks have. And that's really, I think, the heart of, of, of meaning making. I guess I can go next. Um, I, uh, when I, when I think about um, how shared meaning making shows up in, in my work, it, it shows up in really fundamental ways. Um, you know, I, I, I described earlier how, uh, you know, we have one question, which is how democracy can work in places and communities. And um, when you, when you think about uh, people uh, in the places that they, that they live, solving the shared problems that they that they face, um, and and making progress on them together in in equitable ways. Um, what it really takes at at its most fundamental basis is is collective learning. People share, uh, or people people make change based on learning and and shifts that happen in their mindsets, and those happen if it's democratic in collective ways. So, so really uh, as we look across communities and as we learn along with and alongside other communities, what we've learned is, uh, and this is how it really shows up for me on a daily basis, is that, that where people can have the space and the ability to make sense together of, of what they face, what they might do and what they should do, together to face those things, um, that, that those are the places where community democracy flourishes and they're, and they're where there are community democratic practices. And so learning is fundamental to that, uh, which means knowledge is fundamental to that and, and shared uh, collective knowledge. So um, I'm one of those people that whenever I talk, people like there's a long silence as people wonder now, what did he just say and why, why was that important? So I'll let you think about that and pass it over to Dan. Well, thank you, Brad. Yeah, I mean, speaking to both your and Kara's point about involving the community in meaning making and knowledge development, at Borealis, something that I'm always thinking about and something that we're always thinking about as a team and as an organization is how we can involve the work being done by our grantees, how we can learn from them and how we can use that information to influence other folks in the philanthropic sector, other institutions that may not have those connections to grassroots organizations, um, you know, anybody interested for that matter in this work, because when I think about, you know, the grantee grantor relationship, we, you know, it, it really is, there's more to it than we typically think of, you know, it, in the past, we always think about, you know, handing out the money and, and, you know, picking up the report and, you know, that's that. But as I've learned from the work of the organizations that, you know, we fund, uh, they're doing incredible work all throughout the country, but not just that, we're also learning about the context in which they exist. And because we work nationally, issues that we fund turn up differently in, you know, Charlotte, North Carolina than they do from Chicago or from, you know, my town here in Norwalk, Connecticut, all the way out to San Francisco Bay Area. So, you know, while we are, um, you know, while we have our priority areas, that doesn't mean that we hold all the knowledge about what that looks like. We're learning about what that looks like all throughout the country from the folks we're funding participating in that work who themselves may be learning from people in their community they're in conversation with about with them about that they're in community with them about that so this is all a process of taking you know that information sharing it with people who may not be part of that and deepening our understanding of what these movements that we fund look like all throughout the country uh, and i think that we're all better as a, as a result of that and we're able to be a bit more fluent in 
you know, how we discuss social issues of the day and what that looks like from one community to the next. And again, it was John Donne, I'm paraphrasing, you said, no one is an island. Um, you know, we're, we don't exist. We don't hold the knowledge to all of that. We don't profess to. Um, we need to build that with the people that we're in community and relationship with. So. No, thank you all. And just hearing lots of things about kind of the vantage where you where you sit and how you use that and utilize that in ways that support the shared meaning making and lots of stuff about and even kind of reflecting on some stuff that we've already discussed in our prep because we had some really cool conversations during um, as we were preparing for this um, just lots about relationships uh, is what I'm hearing. And I know that each of you has many examples of kind of how this knowledge work looks in practice. You know, we talk about how it shows up, but what, what does it really look like on the day-to-day -day basis and in practice? So I wanted to ask if you could each just choose one, one example to share with us, um, just a, again, about how it looks in the day-to-day. So, oh, hello. Okay. You go, Kara. <laughs> I'll go. All right. Um, so this kind of just really underscores the point that we've already been talking about. But from a personal vantage point, I think some of the, the most fulfilling um, and insightful um, um, opportunities that have arisen just in terms of meaning making have really been around setting the table for, for grantees, grantee roundtables, le learning sessions where you do just open up and you go into community and allow, um, whether it be nonprofits, individuals with lived experience, representatives from government, just um, a, a combination of stakeholders to really sit around a table and share and, 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 and explore um, the needs and challenges and, and opportunities for change that they're seeing. So, I mean, that's a very I think, practical and just very effective way. And every time we, start planning a, a grantee roundtable, I get excited because it's just, it's so much better than reading grant reports. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's just one, one example. I'll share, um, I'll share a way that this shows up in my, in my work um, and, and in, and in a community work by just telling you a story about a specific community. Um, I'd earlier mentioned that that the way the way we work at, at Kettering with with other communities is to sort of you know learn alongside them. So it's not like we're imparting special information or anything, but we're trying to create places where uh, settings in which people can share from different communities what they're learning about about uh, about facing the the problems that they face in their places. And I want to tell you a story about um, a. a a very, very small place called Borrego Springs, California. It's in Southern California. It's in San Diego County. Um, and it's like in, in California, the counties are like massive. So, so it's a tiny, tiny little place, very remote, so remote um, and so tiny. They, they don't have their own government. They, they have like an informal sort of like council that, that like it's a bunch of people who kind of govern the place because they can uh, in a, in a, in a, kind and loving way i don't mean this to sound like an autocracy but it's just like it's like one of those kind of really remote places but they they were a part of a group of uh, uh of other communities we were learning along with about what what uh was showing up for them during the pandemic and how they how they were facing the different kinds of kinds of challenges that all the communities faced in the pandemic when all sorts of institutional structures were suddenly decimated um, and so they, one of the early things we did with, with Borrego Springs and others is to sort of suggest, well, why don't you draw a map, sort of a conceptual map of how your work is going and, and what your place is like. And so they drew kind of a, you know, a, a functional map of like, here's where the libraries are and the cultural institutions and the, you know, and there's a school and, and the police and the, the all very institutional. And then the person who was doing the drawing had this brainstorm and sort of drew all these little birds all around like little ravens and um and so as we were sharing our maps and they we said what are what's with these birds what are these birds here 
and the person who did the drawing said, you know, as I was reflecting, I realized that, you know, there are people in the community who are just constantly talking to one another, going from place to place to place to place to place, and we're constantly interacting with one another and, and connecting and talking. And at, as the, the people we were working with described this, they realized, they came to the understanding that the way they self-governed was through this sort of mechanism of informal, ubiquitous, small conversations. And it was like an eye opener to them because once they see that, now they can say, oh, a way we can operate more effectively and more effectively address our, um, our shared problems is to maybe improve our abilities to speak to one another. And this came from their self-reflection together about how it is and what it is they're already doing. So it was, a sh it was a, an episode of shared meaning making. Um, so, so that's a little story I just I, I stuck in my head. I wanted to share that and, and I'm gonna make Dan talk now. Thanks, Brad. You know, in, in listening to both of the examples you shared, uh, I think, you know, I came prepared with an example, but you know, now I'm gonna be able to flesh it out even more and pull a little bit of both of what you were um, just talking about. So something that we are kind of perpetually looking at here at Borealis is the collection of demographics about our grantees, right? So on each application to one of our funds, we include a section on demographics, who comprises the organization that we are, you know, being asked to fund and who are part of the communities that they serve. Um, and so when I first started three years ago at Borealis, we had a set of demographics that, you know, were, as far as I could tell, pretty standard as far as, you know, looking around at demographics that other organizations might collect up their grantees or something you might see on the U.S. Census. It, it looked pretty similar to that, which itself has, by the way, you know, grown and, and, and been fleshed out over the years and continues to grow. And so looking at that evolution, we decided about a year in, one of our program staff members said, you know, I think we maybe can flesh this out a bit, we can collect deeper information about our grantees and learn a little bit more about the context in which they exist. Now, keeping in mind, we're an intermediary, so we need to use this money, this information for our own fundraising purposes, for our reporting purposes to the public and also to our funders. So in looking to tell a deeper story about that, we started a conversation internally, looking around at different demographics collection methods to see you know, what was more comprehensive, what was more equitable and included a wider range of identities that show up in the communities we fund. Uh, and so we developed a more robust demographics collection set that way. And so we used that for about a year and a half. And then, you know, we got to thinking about it and thought, you know, we are seeing each one of our funds might collect a little bit of different information from the communities they serve on their applications that may not fit into the standardized template. Um, how can we, obtain information like that, how can we really learn about the organizations we're funding and the communities they exist in if we're not in conversation with them? So what we did is put a pause on, you know, making any updates to our system that came from our internal decisions and reached out to our grantees. We sent out a survey. We asked, you know, here's what we've been asking thus far, you know, collecting that information, but also left a little space in the survey is there an identity here that you think would be um, helpful to have represented? Do you feel like you're able to fully show up uh, in the community that you exist in as yourself in these grant applications and these demographics? We wanna be able to say who we're funding and elevate your work. And from that, we learned a lot about what we could build into these applications in the future, the kind of data that we can collect. I apologize, I'm just keeping a timer on myself. And you know, again, we're building our, ability to be able to share this knowledge with our with the, the, the grantees we fund the communities they exist in and demonstrate that something different is possible right that we don't just have to collect the same demographics year after year we can learn from our communities about which identities are most you know um, prominent in their communities so again shared meaning making involving the grantee in that you know not just the collection of the data but how the data is collected is going to make a huge impact. Um, for how we report on what we do. 
Angela, can I just jump in with one additional yeah. thought to add to the list in terms of shared, shared meaning making in the role of philanthropy? Um, so I think it, I think it's philanthropy is um, very much um, in a position to convene, to gather, to create space for communities to, to come together and, and, and process these things out. But I also think there are wonderful opportunities for us to get out of the way, right? So we don't even have to do all of that stuff. We can just amplify and um, put out the it amplify the voice of community um, without putting our you know our touch onto it. So one example um, of uh, that the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven just started doing recently is just streamlining all of our reports and pictures and success stories, and that's a whole that's a whole other thing. What a success story is um, directly to our communications team, so they just get those pictures out, get those stories out. Um, in a very unrefined, there's no processing of the outcomes and all of that. It's just getting those stories out into the community and to audiences that they may not have, have reached. So I think that is another role of philanthropy to sort of get out of the way. And um, in addition to creating those spaces uh, for folks to gather. So I just wanted to lift that up as an additional example. Yeah, no, Kara, I'm glad you, you jumped in there with that because I was actually, um, going to come back to you and ask you if you would share a little bit more. I was really intrigued about the notion of straddling, you know, that kind of you're the person who can be in the, at the strategy table at, at one point and also in communication with grantees. So just curious about how that, how you, how you make sense of that or what that role means, you know, in, in your day to day. Yeah, well, it's really interesting because, I mean, just kind of by proxy, I really have a, a great view into process and like in the database. I'm not database expert, but I, I'm definitely in there on a regular basis, um, just in terms of moving grant reports and things along in our process. So um, kind of understanding that um, and how sometimes, you know, they say what culture eats strategy for breakfast, sometimes process can do that too. Um, and, you know, one of the examples we talked about in our prep call was around demographic information and how um, we, we collect it, right? We collect it in pursuit of racial equity. We collect it at the application phase and we were collecting it at the reporting phase. Um, but realizing that that additional collection of information, although in pursuit of the greater good of achieving and just kind of not achieving, but, you know, advancing racial equity, um, we were slowing down grant payments. And we were slowing down the process and, and putting another layer of requirement on grantees. So um, it was a great and honest moment to say, you know, that um, is this really necessary? How is this helpful? Do we really have the capacity to analyze this data on the tail end every year as we're making grants? And truthfully, we didn't. Um, so to be able to let go of that, and I think having the vantage point of both the process side and being in the database, but also understanding the strategy and like and, and the reporting and how it all kind of fits together. Um, it it I think it helps with that, helps with that. And just to kind of comment on what, what Dan was saying in terms of demographics too, the the process database side of my brain, uh, when I hear change in, in demographics, I'm like, oh my gosh, how are you coding that? How like that sounds like a nightmare to be able to track different data sets every year. So um, for better or for worse, that's just a, a part of how I see the world. But um, yeah, I think it's I think it's it's beneficial. Thank you. And what's coming up for me too, and you know, we we of course all you know love community engagement, and then there's also the challenge of I think we talk about it as you know that kind of getting information and data and input, and that whole sense of urgency. Right. And what, you know, whenever we're working with community members, with activists, with change agents in any way, we're always kind of balancing that. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, Brad or Dan, in kind of your experience, and especially in that kind of asking for grantees or broader community members to take that time to reflect or even give input into philanthropy and what philanthropy is collecting. Um, just curious about that in your work. Yeah, it's a, it's a massive tension actually. Um, uh, I'll say um, 
on a on on the on our, our organizational level, we do a terrible job at, at, at any kind of knowledge management. So, so we're, we're, we're the example of how not to do it, but um, where the tension is really exquisite, it seems to me in, in thinking about the, um, the, the learning we've done with other communities is, is on a community level, just as you suggest, um, the, the tension between you know, action and outcomes and taking the time and having the space to, to reflect and make shared meaning together. Um, and, and the feeling like that all that time spent in the latter is taking away time from the former um, for, for, for right or wrong um, is, is, is a real tension. And, um, and, I, and I would say it's, it's made, you know, again, my, 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 my work is sort of community centered, even though I'm often some, you know, national organization um focused on like how is it that things are happening in a community and um when you when you come to like shared meaning making to, to me another one of the tensions that's super important is um and and difficult is the distinction between data and knowledge or or the or understanding what the implications of that that data is and so you know you can you know in a lot of cases there's like you know, maybe a, a handful of, of of data points that, that could be said, but what's important is what is the sense that people make of the implications of those things. So when I say, for instance, if, if people in a place realize that, oh, we have a lot of connectors here, um, then what's really important though is not just like knowing that 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 exists, but saying, okay, what are the implications of, of what that means for how we do our work in this community? And those only come out, they, they can really only be accessed through an experiential kind of time bound embodied process where people talk together about what it means to them. Otherwise, it's just a, it's just a statement on a piece of paper or in a report and you don't know what, how, how it matters in my community that we have connectors and could do with more. So, so those two tensions is the, 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 the time the time reflection versus, you know, results outcome, and also the, the, the static information versus the embodied knowledge where we understand and have made sense of what the implications of that knowledge are. So I'll shut up. Yeah, I think, you know, there are, going back to my example of, you know, involving the community that of our grantees in updating demographic data, you know, it, you, Kara spoke perfectly to the, the tension right in here and in there, you know, it is a labor intensive process, we need to talk amongst my own team about the results of the survey that we sent out, whether, you know, everything that we've collected uh, regarding new data to possibly collect that was passed along from our grantees is something that we have the time and capacity to be and and, and whether it's feasible to integrate it into our you know, data collection tools and methods. Um, you know, ideally we would just have, you know, an open, you know, type of narrative about how you show up and we'll figure out a way to do it. And it's not to say we don't do that, we do, but, you know, obviously there is a, um, there's, there's a capacity component in that. You know, even in my time here at Borealis, we haven't always had the capacity to be able to imagine the possibility we could do something like this, right? So you want to be able to, know that if you're going to engage in this kind of endeavor that you have the capacity in your organization to do such a thing you have to I think when you're being when you're in conversation and in relationship with folks who you want to be involved in this process it is good to be transparent with them and let them know like if you don't feel comfortable answering this if you don't have the time to answer this we want to acknowledge that we want to thank you for what you can provide us with and just to let you know, too, you know, we will take your set. We, we find a way to say, you know, we can't implement everything that you may suggest just because of capacity, because of time. But I think we want to set the precedent in all that we do that we are open to hearing from you. You know, you are part of what we do. And, you know, we value your input, not just because, not just as a thing that we say, but also we are in the process of creating this knowledge together 
we are in the process of you know learning what this looks like together and there will always be bumps along the way and there will always be imperfections but you know involving the these communities via grantees in this work is i think how we slowly but surely get there i wanted to add one more thing about knowledge um, shared meaning making you know and and just different methods of data collection that came up when when carrie you were saying something earlier another way that we've kind of tried to implement this is by allowing grantees the freedom to submit video report responses or in some cases letting them show up and, and speak in the way that they you know feel that they best represent themselves you know that's a change on our end that's a little bit smaller and easier to implement but again it's all about uh, demonstrating to our communities that we are by and large making our best effort to involve you in the effort of shared meaning making and knowledge creation mm -hmm. uh, because we do genuinely care and we source from movements you know we we intentionally you know look to hire folks who are part of these social movements so we also have that aspect of shared meaning making and knowledge creation from the community level so when we say we care you know, that's one way in which we try to back it up is to say, you know, um, we we are hiring, we're trying to populate our staff from the communities that we're working to support. So, yeah, but, but but you know, the, 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 these tensions are real and they do need to be negotiated regularly and named, yeah. so. Well, this is really, oops, sorry, really cool that I'm getting all my questions answered. Kara, did you want to say something else before we open up to broader questions? Yeah, I just wanted to add. So in the in the pursuit and process of meaning making um, as foundations, I think one important piece that's maybe the sort of period at the end of the sentence is circling back. Like once you've done your process, once you've figured out what the meaning making is and you've got the, the bullet points, like the summary, to put that back, communicate that back out. Um, uh, Time and again, I think foundations make this mistake of processing internally and not um, reaching back to say, here's what we learned, here's what we're thinking, here are our next steps. Um, and I know, I know my foundation never does that, but I mean, we, we do have a practice of, of following up and sending emails kind of with those summaries, but I think it's just very important. Um, and it can be done, you know, many mistakes have been made, I think, over time with that. Yeah, sure. Well, so Manuela, do you have some questions from participants for us? Yes, we do. We have some questions that folks have shared to me. And for all of you in the room, I encourage you if you want to add your questions in the chat or send them to me directly or raise your hand, we would love to get you involved into the conversation. Uh, the first question I have for everyone is, when looking at knowledge work, a huge part of it is the reporting that a lot of you spoke around. And as we as leaders try to incorporate more equitable practice into our institutions, reporting usually has a huge weight on the secrecy of the written word. And so as we think about, have you in your institutions or have you thought about, have, are you thinking about this? How are you thinking about uh, creative ways of communicating a lot of the learnings and that you're seeing back out into the community? I know, um, Kara, you mentioned this with you, your communications team is sending out, uh, really focusing on the stories that you're putting back out into the community. And Dan, you just mentioned with the video and the applications, but I think folks are curious to hear if y'all are having these conversations as knowledge um, folks in your organizations, and if you've seen creative ways on how to make the, that reporting accessible back out into the community. I can say yes, we are actively having these conversations um, and thinking about how, um, you know, kind of piloting with smaller grant programs and how we can roll this out, whether it be one-on-one uh, uh, con -on -one conversations, um, additional, additional site visits, and COVID really did kind of, I think, show us that the turnaround can be quicker, the, the, the streams of communication can be more effective when you can just pick up a phone or meet with someone in person. Um, we, uh, we did, we sent out a survey with our last round of grant reporting asking grantees kind of what their preference was, uh, just in future thinking about, you know, would they want to uh, forgo written reports versus a phone call or a site visit. Um, 
And that surprisingly, that survey didn't have a lot of responses. So uh, curious to know why that is, but uh, it's it's absolutely on the forefront of, of my mind. And I know my, the, my foundation as well. Um, so hopefully there'll be some exciting changes in the near future. Thank you so much. Oh, Dan, I see you came off mute. Oh yeah, no, I just wanted to add on to that. Yes, also, it's something we're always as well uh, thinking about. I think that, you know, you wanna think about what, 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 I, what I think about when I get these questions is I think about it from a couple of different lenses. I think about it from a lens of accessibility. One of our funds, the Disability Inclusion Fund, um, you know, really works to advance the cause of disability justice in communities throughout the country. And so as part of that, we've made it a big focus to think about how our grant applications can be more accessible um, for those, you know, who aren't able to um, present an application, you know, in the written word. Um, if it's something, you know, small, like finding a list of screen readers that we've included with our applications or our, we have a guide that we provide with all, to all of our applicants on how to navigate our portal. We include, you know, here's screen reader software we recommend. We do, um, we hire la live transcriptions. Some of our funds are, are hiring la live translators for, you know, pre request for proposal webinars. Um, so, you know, it's kind of cool if you are showing up and you want to hear the English version, you click one Zoom link. And if you want to hear the Spanish version, you click another link and, you know, they'll translate it live. We have one tomorrow we're doing for one of the funds I work with that's going to proceed like that. Again, related to what I said earlier, you know, you have to have the budget to be able to do that. As an intermediary, we are able to let our, you know, funders know, like, this is what we're hearing from our grantees. We need to be able to have the capacity to do this. And if we do this, then the added benefit will be that we're able to, you know, appeal to a wider base of, you know, potential applicants, potential movements that could be funded, so on and so forth. Uh, and again, you know, I, 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 people express themselves in different ways. You know, I write very differently than I talk. So I imagine I'm not the only person like that. Um, and, uh, you know, from that come, you know, different appeals to different people. So if it's possible, we now have the technology to do it. I highly encourage your foundation to be able to do it. Um, I'm always happy to talk to anybody, um, about how to do it in your foundation. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. It's making me think too about, um, ways to really incorporate the process like whenever we're separating out this is the institution and this is community right we we're going to have that challenge so just thinking about ways of incorporating a number of years ago I worked with a group of change makers and they came from grant grantees of the um, foundation but also um, the organizations that were doing capacity building so they really came from across the different spaces in the initiative. And what was really exciting about that was that we, we designed the process together as this group. And their lived experience actually became the data that we were together analyzing in order to together write the report. And now, guaranteed, this was a highly resourced project. You know, not everybody has the opportunity to provide stipends for 12 change makers to come together in this process. Um, but it just, in whenever we can kind of like break down those boundaries and really engage together, I think there's some really exciting things that can, can happen in those spaces. Great, thank you so much. May, I see you're joining us and your hands raised. Hey, welcome, May. Yeah, thanks. Um, actually, you, both of you kind of touched on what I my question is, which is <clears throat> with all this information that you're gathering, do you see that at some point in time it will lead to more trust-based philanthropy? And the reason why I ask is because um, at the East Bay Community Foundation where I work, since the pandemic happened, we, we did away with any grant applications. We literally had uh, grantees um, send us an email, say what they need, and then our staff would then dig into taking a look at it. And then we then would make the grants. <clears throat> we knew that they were very busy with what they were doing 
And we were like, don't give us reports. And we've been encouraging our donor advice funders to also do something similar. Because even though we love all this information, I'm just thinking from a practical point of view for those grantees on the ground who just don't have the staff, don't have the capacity. And yeah, it's great when you have stipends that you can pay for their staff to attend. That's always fabulous. Um, but absent that for everyone to be able to attend, I'm just kind of curious. Thanks. I actually have a, a thought on that. Um, that it, it, first of all, here, here. Uh, I, I love the the um, the no application. Not a, we're not a grant making foundation, so it's easy for me to say that. But um, but but also the uh, the no no reporting. Um, and and um, and yet you 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 describe the tension between like so. Are there are there ways for people to learn from one another? So I, I want to maybe um, suggest a, a, like a layer. That that might be might be helpful, um, and and it, it goes to like so. What is being reported? Like what's what's what is the nature of this report? It, it, so setting aside uh, that that most of them are text based and narrative based, and you know and and uh, you know have have some certain kinds of organizational biases. Um, the actual questions that are being answered are are important. I think. And so if you want to center shared meaning, center shared meaning. Ask something like, what are you learning? You know, which is like, there's not a wrong answer there. Um, what are you struggling with? So it's not, so you're not setting people up to like succeed or report success, but actually just share, you know, here's what we're learning. Here's what we're having trouble learning. Here are our difficulties. Um, and I think, uh, you know, if, if one thing we've learned in COVID uh, is that it is possible um, to find spaces for people to collectively gather where they don't have to bring their bodies to the place. And, and so it can be a low resource and easy entry. And if those spaces are set up where we're going to share what we're learning, not dog and pony shows, not success stories, but just what we're learning that can actually accelerate the meaning making that that the that the no application and no reporting is sort of stimulating um so so i, I want to that, that's a different kind of relationship between funder and grantee which is to center the learning rather than the outcomes mindful outcomes are important and there, there needs to be a, a way to uh to, to capture that but it's also important to share that, um, to center that 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 meaning and 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 sharing of the meaning. Thank you, Brad. Kara, I see you were coming off mute before as well. Yeah, I kind of lost my train of thought now. But I mean, I was gonna I was gonna say that um, I do see a shift in towards um, greater trust based philanthropy practices, and I do I feel kind of odd woman out just I, I there is this trend towards like don't ask for outcomes no written reports and I feel I, I personally feel like there's something that's lost when we're sort of agnostic about everything so that's a, a tension I think I'm working through on my like I don't I'm not I'm, I'm curious to hear more about how how your process works without in applications in in, in email format so uh, maybe we can connect after. Um. Yeah, I'll, I'll just briefly share. Um, because our program staff have been in touch with the grantees, it, it's through phone conversations. Um, and so <clears throat> we just asked them, how have you been using the funding, right? And for some of them, it was taking care of staff uh, with mental health services, other, you know, making sure that, um, staff could um, take care of their kids and and just kind of um, it, it was it was a number of things so it's not like we're not reporting on anything um, what it is is it's just um, yeah I, I would love to I'll have to get more information from our program staff and I'd be happy Cara to um, connect you with them 
because it is something that, that we are promoting and we're hoping that other foundations will also consider doing the same thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd love to hear from Dan and Dr. Uh, Angela as well. Yeah, no, thank you. May oh, sorry, did I stop you there, Angela? Or somebody I heard. Oh, no, I was just saying if there's time, which I hope there is. Yeah, I would love to quickly uh, answer your question because it's something that we are thinking about and implementing when we can at Borealis. Uh, at the fund level, you know, each fund, we have about seven, eight funds at this point. They all operate a little differently. And, you know, I believe we did something similar a couple of years ago, right at the onset of the COVID pandemic, where, you know, you would just basically let us know if you needed support. You know, there were just some basics we had to collect about, like, where to send money to and, you know, verify C3 status and all that. Uh, and I know on limited basis, we've done things of that nature where it's, if not no application at all, then like very limited. One thing I wanted to just quickly note is when it comes to reports, we've tried to be very intentional about, and I think this came out of the trust-based philanthropy community, which I, you know, I have a subscription to, I think it's a Google, uh, I can't, Google Groups. Uh, and so I see the emails, I'm not always able to participate, but uh, I've been to a few webinars and one thing that always comes up that we've tried to implement is if you're not going to use the report information for anything and you can just waive it, waive it. Don't ask people to do more work than is necessary. Uh, if you're going to have a conversation with them, I think questions like, you know, that were mentioned just a moment ago, like what are the challenges you're having? What is it looking like? Which we do do when we do ask for reports and they, that data is going to be used for something. Um, you know, be intentional. There, again, intentionality, going back to demographics, um, you know, don't just repeat the same stuff year after year. Some stuff you may need to carry forward from year to year because it serves a purpose, but you know, don't do anything out of routine habit, I suppose would be the kind of guiding principle for me whenever I think about this work, because other people might be thinking about and looking at things in ways that you haven't imagined and you want to include their uh, insight. So thank you for the question though. Great question. Yeah, just a, a real quick, um, when I work with, with groups, I'm working with a nonprofit intermediary right now. One of the questions that I ask them in, in their matrix is to really identify what do they need evidence for? You know, so what would you like to be able to say publicly with evidence? There's a lot of things you can say about the organization and the work they're doing, um, but what are those specific things that you need that kind of paper trail or specifics from the people that you're working with in your members? And I think that question really does, it, it helps to stop the, we have to collect everything. Right, and we have to have data about everything. No, there's things that we can hear and we can repeat and we can say and bring together and aggregate and make meaning of that doesn't need to be documented on paper with some type of level of rigor for the evidence. So I think even asking that question as an organization, as a foundation, um, helps to prevent that, you know, wanting to collect everything. But thank you for that question. Yes, thank you, May. And thank you for sharing more resources in the chat. We have another question um, in for, that joined us anonymously around how are the communities involved around the design and evolution of the data collection in terms of the methods, the analysis? This is Dan. Uh... I, one way in which we have tried to implement that is by um, having advisory committees for our grant making. A couple of our funds have been piloting that over the past year or two, I would say. And what that looks like is they, you know, our funds, our program officers will reach out to, you know, current grantees, former grantees, people they know from movements and ask them if they'd like to be part of the grant making decision committee. Um, we then kind of tailor our technological resources to be able to accommodate that. Our grants portal has a reviewer portal where if you are part of an advisory committee for a fund, you can join and provide your comments, you know, so on and so forth. But that's a priority of ours that we've tried to really embody. Um, you know, we don't want to have, um, you know, decisions being made by a limited number of people. Um, we want to broaden that as much as possible and have people who are affected by these movements have some say into that. That's helpful. Thank you, Dan. 
Uh, we have a, another question that's interesting around the space that we're in right now. So are, are the panelists or others on the call creating online spaces for grantee learning and sharing? If so, what's working and what isn't? Any thoughts from the panelists or anyone else on the call that wanted to hear? That's a really great question. Um, I So one example I could lift up for my foundation is so... Um, we um, have a, a, a separate website called um, GNH Community, um, and it's, it's run by a staff person who I believe is on the call today. Um, and it really is just an open community space for nonprofits and individuals to post upcoming events, um, discussion topics on um, pretty much anything related to community, videos, um, active streams, it's um, that, uh, that is one, one place that has existed um, for quite some time, um, probably over 10 years, maybe 15 years. Thank you so much, Kara. Dan, I see you joined us off mute. Yeah, thank you. We are uh, doing that as well. We actually just had a call last week. We invited our grantees to, we invited donors to, it was about building community safety strategies that was hosted by our Communities Transforming Policing Fund, but was a panel much like this, uh, consisting of uh, folks in our grantee cohort from that fund, and you know other folks from from um, you know movements that are looking to shift models of community policing, um, and yeah, we're we, we are we're, we're doing that pretty regularly. I would say if you're interested in you know participating in one of those calls or just you know, being an observer, check out our website. Um, I think we're pretty good about updating um, some of those webinars. Thank you, Dan and Kara. So I know we're almost getting to time, but we have another question that I think would be really powerful to end our time on. And so we have a question around what are some specific practices that you have institutionalized to flip the power away from the donor to the grantees in your grant development, sourcing, or exploration processes? I don't know if um, Dr. Angela or Brad, if you want to kick us off to share any thoughts. Well, that's a scary question because because not enough is is i think the 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 answer um certainly not enough uh and we're constantly battling the pathologies created by the power structure that that we're we're embedded in as as a funding entity even even though we're a non non-funder um and so i i think the uh the best answer i can give which is a, a provisional and poor answer is is that um, we try to use strategies that that center the experience of people in the community and, and Angela was describing the um, a, a particularly uh, intricate one uh, but they don't all have to be that um, that that intricate uh, mm -hmm. but to the extent that that it can just like we, we can we can work to not be studying others but to be being with others while they do what they're going to do and learn from what they can learn uh, is, is important. So the, it, I, I don't have a powerful response to that. And, and if I had one, I would, I, I would fall at your feet and thank you. So, or if you have one. I know, I think for me, it's more of a lesson learned. And this was actually something I learned in the consulting space rather than directly in philanthropy, you know, in a foundation. And that was to be really clear with myself about what the foundation I'm working with is really up to. Um, I provided some services that were about doing focus groups and scanning and bringing groups together um, to share their input. And the way I approached it was really about network building, right? And that something would happen after supported by the foundation would happen after this these groups got together so that's how i entered into it um much to my my learning <laughs> um afterwards it really was just i think a report that was going to be released 
but all of that energy that we kind of facilitated and supported in the focus group data collection part, um, I, didn't, I didn't ask, right? What is the foundation going to do with this later? And how is this gonna continue? So I think to me, again, that's not a, it's not a how to, but more of a lesson learned of being really honest and transparent with what these processes are really about. And when they are about just reporting or just gathering and sharing information, um, really not to portray them as, as more than that. I hope that wasn't too of a negative thought at the end, <laughs> but I think that the transparency is really important. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much. This has been a powerful conversation. I know we could continue to chat for hours on end because there's so much to learn. And, and, um, and I know all of you participants and attendees, thank you so much for joining. You have so many resources I know that, of, that you're doing within your institution. And so I encourage you to add them in the chat if there's anything else that you think we can share in our learning of this topic. Um, thank you all so much. Before hopping off, I do just want to share my screen once again and let everyone know uh, all the information of the speakers are available to all of you if you want to continue the conversations with our speakers or with others here on the call please let me know thank you so much dr angela dan kara and grad for joining us today it's been a pleasure having you in our space in our community and to learn together we're going to be sharing the oh thank you kate for sharing that in the chat and a final reminder reminder before we hop off the career pathways applications are available now and so if you're interested in joining us in next year's career pathways program we encourage you to go to career pathways slash apply to learn more information tomorrow i'll be hosting an information session and an office hours to answer any questions about the program or the office hours but thank you all very very much for being here for being present and for your time and and for all the wonderful resources. We wish you all the best and um, thank you once again. Bye everyone. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.